So here's a review. We can start studying for that. So this thing is closed, but so if I give you, I mean, if I expect you to know like the Lincoln formula, it's like the formula for back crop and stuff like that, I'll give you that. So major formulas, I'll give you. Um, As far as what you need to review, um, we talked about the motivation. The neural nets for control. Major motivation we've seen is that they're nonlinear systems are hard to control. Neural nets to model nonlinear systems. So that's a good fit. Um, neural nets are high speed computational devices. They run in parallel with a bunch of neurons, and you can have millions of neurons already at the same time. And this may not be one of my mentions, but let's add it to the list. No, that's a fault. Um, meaning, if you have a big network that has like 20 neurons, 30 neurons in a hidden layer, one of those neurons can break and quit working, and you still get a decent cancer. You're okay. The perfect answer is that. It can handle those kind of problems. All right, second thing is we talked about an artificial neuron, biological neuron. So you should be able to do this, draw a picture of. A artificial neuron with the weights and the biological neuron, remember that, with the gas on, dendrites, synapses. So you should be able to draw both of those. Go back and look at your notes for the pictures. Make sure you can draw and label those. And also, how this thing, the artificial one, is modeled after the biological one. Like, for example, the synapses equal the weights. Or not equal, but they're represented by. The weights, because over here, the synapses modify the signal. Over here, the weights multiply and modify the signal. We took artificial neurons and turned them into simple networks. So make sure you know how to do the threshold, activation functions, sigmoid. Uh, tan H. So make sure you know how to process those and what they are. We went through that. Um, why a bias neuron? Oh, I added the list linear neurons, of course. Why a bias neuron? Why do we scale 
input and output data. Talk about that. So go back and review that so you understand it. We also did those really simple perceptron neural nets. So be prepared to do any of those. Like the OR network, you trained in the AND network. Uh, we did the XOR, stuff like that, like right? those real simple little drills. Um, know how to do the forward calculation. And then how to do the perceptron training. Okay. Um, So that's the homework problem. So go back and review the homework that you guys did. Remember that one when you did the different cases and the different um, numbers. And then we did backprop. So you, we did two parts of this. For homework, you did the derivation, and we did that in class. So you should be able to do that. Um, and you should also be able to do the calculations. And again, if I ask you to do a back prop, I'll give you the formulas for the deltas and stuff like that. Um, also, know the theory. Then it's a method to minimize the squared error. And that's kind of part of the derivation, right? Remember, we define the error of all of the output neurons squared, and that's where you start to do the derivation. We talked about some issues with it, like slow training. And then you may end up in a local minimum. And we talked about different methods to deal with that. Right? The normal works a bit changes the learning rate as it goes to address both of these. Um, you can also add more neurons to get out of a local minimum. We talked about that, so we're not going to do that. Uh, and then the weight jogging thing uh, that NeuralWorks does helps as well. So that's all fair game on the exam of the system modeling. The in class assignment the thing we did in here. Um, so make sure you know how to do that, how to take the, the differential equations, difference them, and figure out what the inputs and the outputs to a neural to a neural net for a model you can be. And we've done a lot of modeling right in the examples. The truck backer upper had a model, the distillation column had a model. So we're make sure you can do that. And then we've had two architectures of three that we actually kind of looked at. One was called copy existing, which is really easy. It's just where you have an existing controller and you take the data from the controller and use it to train. Uh, we did inverse control, that's the two link robot arm. And then we did the neural model adaptive control. That's the truck backer up here. Now, especially for something like this, I'm going to ask you about all the details. 
But I might, I mean, a valid question would be explain how the truck backer upper controller was trained. Back propagating through the model and things like that. Or I may give you a system <coughs> and say, tell me how you do an inverse control of it. Which again, is not hard. You just collect data and then flip it, right? So those would be fair questions. And then we'll stop there for the quiz or for the exam. Uh, how long will be the exam? Is it going to be like, how long will be the exam? How long will it take? Or how long will I give you? Is what you want to know, right? Yeah. The, I'll give you, it'll be at least an hour. I'll look and see how long the quiz is or the test is. It will be an hour plus, uh, not longer than the normal class period. All right. And if you're on Zoom, you need to come in for the exam on that day. It's an in-person exam. Okay. Questions about the exam? What's expected? What's the study? Hopefully I've given you enough here. I always love this question. Is there anything I haven't mentioned that you wonder whether it's on the exam? Because then you guys don't want to say anything because you're afraid to go, oh, yeah, I'll have it down in the list. Right? How hard is still call them? No, we won't. I won't consider that. Although it's just another example of, of this, right? Oh. Yeah. And in the second exam, we'll have a lot of uh, applications. So there will be questions on there about each different application, what the architecture was that was used, and things like that. In this exam, it will be more, I'll give you a simple system and say, model it, or is that? Somewhere, I guess there you go. Up here. Model it, how would you do a neural network model in this system? Or how would you do inverse control? Tell me how you would do it. So those are the kind of questions we're doing this. So we need to be able to do what we did on the end class assignment for like yeah, derivation of yeah, that's the system model instead. Oh of the end class assignment. Oh. So make sure you review that, especially if you struggle with that and have to, I mean I, the intent was for you to ask questions in class to learn how to do it. And it's not hard, you just difference the derivatives and then you rearrange that to get it in the right order. Well, there are any questions about like neural works or anything? No, I don't usually do that. You want a question? No. <laughs> I don't know what I'd ask. I mean, I, you know, a valid question would be, what does the min-max table do? But that's just what is, that's the scaling thing, right? What is scaling? Why do we scale data? Maybe a little bit too short to ask, but will the final be multiple choice and online? No, it's oh. a regular final. I mean, the second exam. The second exam is the final. And it's just exam number two. So it would be in class, just like, yeah. yeah, okay, gotcha. Did you want us to remember uh, specific, like, historical content, context in terms of, like, who gets credit for bad propagation? Sure, yeah. You thought extra credit option? No, not usually. All right, we're going to look at an example, another application.
It's a long title for this paper, but it's on Blackboard. It really means there's two tanks that liquid in it and they try to control the rubber. So here's a picture of what this thing is done. There's a tank up here. Tank number one, and it's got some liquid in it. And the pipe that comes out of this thing goes through a flow restriction to the resistance on one. And it goes down to another tank. Fluid comes out of that, goes through the flow restriction, resistance part two. Goes into a reservoir. Again, liquid comes out, goes into a pump. So it then pumps up the little loop there on the spot. Pumps up to a valve. That's a setting view. That liquid goes up and goes into the tank bed. So we got the liquid flowing down. The reservoir the pump then pumps back up, and the valve controls how much flow goes up to the top. It's a pretty simple system. We're going to follow the height of the fluid in this tank in each one. And the height here, H2. And via a pressure sensor, we can measure the height of the fluid in tank two because the, the higher the, the level, the higher the pressure at the bottom, right? It's rho GH. Well, they don't measure the height in H1 direction. All they get is the pressure room. But each tank is 20 meters. And it's a nonlinear system. Just because the tank outflow is proportional to the square root of the liquid height. And again, you can only measure at H2, but not directly at H1. So here's the system equations. Here's a model. There's the valve setting. This is the gain for the valve. Uh, C one's a cross section. I'll define that. Here's the resistance, and there's the H one. And then H two dot. Those are the heights we already talked about. P2 is proportional to H2, so we can measure that. 
So U is the control valve. A B is the valve gain. And C1 and C2 are the cross sectional areas. The tanks. And R1 and R2, we already talked about those. Those are the flow resistance. All right, so let's say that those equations were on the exam this week, and I said make a system model. You difference them, right? You difference this, and you say H1. Difference in forward, the delta T, difference that. And what would you say that H2 and H1 depend on? Those are the outputs of the system model. They depend on H1 and H2 at the previous time step, right? And then they depend upon H1 and H2 at the previous time step. And then the valve setting, right? So that's the input. See how I did that? A different stat. I'm going to shove all of the T's over on this side. All of this stuff is at the current time. And then we forward difference over there. Now I'm going to show you the system model that they use. This is the neural net. And it's going to predict Q. The big H Q at T minus L. H2, sorry, H2 of T. Got this back with the T plus one there. So it's take the current value here, and then one pass value. And it's going to take U, the pass value of U. It's got a hidden layer. And I'll tell you more about what's inside here in a minute. So what do you think about that compared to what we said over here? Over here we said H1, yeah, two plus one, H2 plus one. is a function of H1 of T, H2 of T, and U of T, right? So why do you suppose they did this? And where is H1? Well, they want And you go, well, I know where H1 is, it's right there. Have you seen that math joke? It's supposedly a question. Um, there was a problem with this. There's a math exam that said find x. Have you seen that? And the person answered that said, there it is. <laughs> I don't know that it actually happened or whether it was a joke. All right, so where is H1 in our neural net model? 
Is it what? Yeah, why don't we have H1 over here? Do you remember? Which one can we measure in the system? Yeah, we can only measure H2. H1 is not available, so it's essentially a So they couldn't measure H1 to put it in. Now they're trying to predict H2, and they know that H2 depends upon H1 and also H, I'm sorry, H1 and H2. And so I think what they did was they said, okay, well, let's put in two pass on steps here to make up for the fact that that variable you don't have access to. Kind of like a state variable that you would introduce in a second order equation to bring down the first order. But then we're saying we can't measure those. And then they also did this, which is a little different. So they said, well, they added an extra time step for the control variable. And I'm sure that there was a lot of work behind the scenes where they tried different inputs. But part of their goal was to say, well, if we do have a hidden variable in the system, can the neural net still run in the system? It turns out. And we saw that with the distillation column as well, right? There's all kinds of state variables inside the column that were not even in the state variable. Okay, so that's their neural net model. And one of the reasons, I guess the main reason I show you this paper uh, is on how they create these neural nets. Because when, at the end of it, when they're doing a controller, they don't use a neural net as a controller. All they do is the model. But I want to show you there's an interesting way that they do the inputs to this model. That we want to keep in our toolbox of things that we might try. Because that's really what we do in a lot of these engineering classes is when you're trying to attack different problems, you learn different tools, and that's true in math as well. Different tools, so you're really learning how to use different wrenches and different pliers and different screwdrivers that are math and engineering and science tools to solve problems. So this is a tool on how to model a system. All right, so we have two different data representations. All of my markers are fading. Okay, number one. Oh, that's solid there. Single data model. What do you call it? S N. DM for short, big fancy name, meaning just what we've already always been doing for how we do models, is that for each input, as a single input term. So essentially no big deal. Let they call it something because they want to compare it to the next thing, which is a big deal. Well, sort of a big deal. So, a picture of this thing of the network is you have one neuron for each of those inputs that I listed over there. All right, so they put some hidden neurons in, they have one neuron for each input neuron. Oh, but these were eight um, hidden neurons. All right, so that's the normal method. And then they had this thing called spread encoding.
call this S E. So for for a single input, we're just going to pick like H two and T. So we're talking about the very first number that's going in there. H two of T, we assign L neurons. The way those are assigned, oh, we assign L neurons, and you do that uh, between each two minimum value and H max. So we find the minimum and the maximum values for H2. So it might go from like 5 to 23. And then we create an axis. Of the data axis, and this is an H2 axis, and this is the neuron input value. How does that work? So let's say we assign eight neurons to the range between the two. So here's the minimum value, here's the maximum value. H that H2 can have. And then we assign eight neurons evenly spaced. So let's see if I can do that. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I botched it out of here. Six, eight, right? Two, four, six, eight. So those are assigned along that axis. And then if the value of H2 that I want to put in falls here. All right, so that's the number that I want to put into my neural net. I put a Gaussian distribution centered at that value. And then that gives me the values that I have to put in for each of my neurons. Kind of weird, but Right, so these values are what actually going to neurons. So what they're really doing is they're saying, okay, let me turn my H2 into a picture, and then let's input that picture into the network instead of a value. And the reason they did that was because uh, people have found out that neural nets are really good at image and picture recognition and classification. So they thought, well, instead of just putting a number in, let's put of distribution or a picture of the image. And so let's say that the H2 value was over here instead of there, then the hump would be over here, and that would give you the values that you put into the neuron. So it would shift this hump, and so the, the data field for that neuron value would spread out as a picture of input values. If you look at the paper that they show you, uh, the paper uh, that I put on Blackboard, there's maybe a better diagram in there that I'll pull up. Where they're showing that very good. So the, the value, they're using max instead of H. There's the minimum value. Here's the max. You spread neurons across there. And if the x value is over here on the left side in this data axis, then the neurons have these inputs. And then the size of the circle is how much goes in. Whereas if the value is over here, then you get a different pattern over here centered at the peak of that value. So you can see how looking at that even visually is a different input pattern for different values. And the idea was that it could handle the pattern maybe better than just putting in a number.
So that's a different strategy for putting in data to a neural net. There's the single node yeah. data model, which is what we've been using. And then there's the spread encoding method represented as a, an advantage, I mean, as a, as a pattern. And so the advantages and different disadvantages to the spread encoding are the pattern maybe can be recognized. That's the advantage. Anybody see a disadvantage? Maybe I need to draw a picture of the network that they use for the spreading coding over here. So here's the spread coding network. Um, they have six hidden neurons. For H, Q, and T, it's spread encoded in over six neurons. And then for H, Q, at T minus one, it's spread encoding over six more. And then for U, at the two different values, so this is U and T, U, T minus one, spread encoding here, spread encoding here. So it's got these fields of neurons, and then of course we're going to have one output neuron that gives H2 and the new value. Notice they didn't spread encode this, which I wondered why, but they've decided not to do that. So do you see a disadvantage to this? Drawing some connections here. Compared to the single node data model, any difference? There's a lot of neurons here, right? So So you might wonder, maybe just adding more neurons to the single node data model would to give the same effect. Because it turns out they'll show, and I'll show you the results. I think I'll show you some of the results. Um, this gives better uh, model, but I think it's because there's just more neurons. An interesting thing about this, though, is that currently a lot of the neural nets image recognition, speech recognition, like your Siri and other speech recognition devices use something called the deep learning. And they actually do, uh, they do pattern matching. In the input data. For example, if you say the word, hey Siri, you get a time signal as you say it. And the deep learning algorithms chop this up into patterns and then they get fed into a network that has built-in neurons with different patterns for each neuron and it tries to match its patterns internally with your signal here and there's a lot of those there's thousands of neurons in there with different patterns and so those patterns get matched to this and then those patterns get matched to larger patterns over a larger time window until it eventually recognizes words and speech um, and so the deep learning convolutional networks do this kind of stuff, which is related to this because there's pattern matching going on inside the network. And so 
the training for this thing, they just ran the system. Essentially, they drove, drove the system around. Very review. Training. And they did a thousand training pairs and a thousand testing. So a thousand training, a thousand tests. And they did this thing where they trained for a while and then they tested and then they trained for a while and some more and tested. And so I'm going to digress here for a minute and talk about that before we go on to the actual control application. So what they did was they trained, let's say, a hundred training pairs and then they tested. Which you, you could do in normal words, right? You could train and then test, and then go back and train again some more, and test. So they test, and then they train, and they test, train, and then they test. And you'll find out that if you do this, and you calculate the RMS error as you train, the error will go down, then they'll test, and so you'll see this in numbers that will spike up. As you found out, the testing error is usually a little bit higher than the train error. So it will spike up, and then they'll train some more, and then test. So these are the testing. Train some more, test, train some more, and you'll reach a point for most problems where. The training error might continue to go down, but the testing error actually goes up. And this is a region over here where you would say that it's overtrained. In other words, it's memorizing the training data, but not generalizing as well on the testing data. Kind of like a polynomial overfit, essentially, overtrained, it's overfit. So, what they did was they said, well, let's do this pattern and then pick the network as the best network and save that and keep that. So that will be the actual network that they use in their experiments. NeuralWorks has this built in, so I'm going to pull it up and show you how that works. And it's always a mystery to me where NeuralWorks is on this machine. You guys remember where I found it last time? It's Mars. It was where? It was like some file. It was like neural to those. Yeah, it's in NeuralWorks professional too. I thought it was in one of these. And the thing is, it, the 
icon won't stick on my desktop because whenever this gets rebooted, it goes. We had to open a folder and go find the uh, the software. Yeah, it's not like a application. So let's see down here. I think it's like a neural. It's not in C, right? Oh, there it is. Where is it located? So it's on the desktop. Or maybe I'm wrong. Let's escape out of here. <clears throat> Let's see it on the desktop. Well, we've got it here. So let's launch this so I can show you how it works. That's the only shared screen with the Zoom. All right, so let's go back and create our iris network. An instant ad backprop. I'm going to do a four, four, three version. We don't need new maps or bipolar for this. Good our training set. <coughs> I want to edit our RMS error instrument to change the number of X values. You're not projecting on the screen. You guys can't see this. <laughs> hey, you guys are just going to sit there? <laughs> I guess for time you figured I knew what I was doing and I didn't. Okay, so let me go back and recreate the network just so you can remember. Sorry about that. So I'm doing the iris. I did a 443 network, took off connect prior, min max table, and bipolar, right? Just like we always do. Oh, I did want to do delta rules, so you guys saved me from doing the wrong thing. Sigmoid, so this is exactly like the um, assignment you guys did. Iris train. So that was quite a turnabout. Usually it's the Zoom people I forget to show the screen to. This time it was you guys. Iris test. So it was a test? So it was supposed to be Iris test on the testing one. Did I pick the wrong one? I suppose. Yep, you're right. So if you go into the I.O. parameters, you can change your training and testing set. So now I have the training and testing. I would have totally botched it up. All right, and I want to tell this thing not to plot every 100. I want to plot every 200 because it compresses it down. All right, and then the way you do this train test, train test thing is I'm going to do a run, I'm going to do a learn, I'm going to do a run, and then I do the save best. So this feature is going to save that best network as it goes through the training and testing. And we're not going to do that many, we're going to do 16,000. And then it's going to save it in this file called BestNet. And you can change this name. You can change it to John's BestNet or something like that. Um, 
And this is how many training pairs it does before it tests. So it'll do a thousand training pairs test, thousand training pairs test. Um, and you can, it'll do 10 retries, so it'll do it 10 times. And you can change that if you want. I'm going to show you the prune feature here in a minute, but not yet. All right, and so as you see this, the error goes down, here's where it tested. Error goes down, here's where it tested, 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 tested. You can see that at kind of the point here, the error starts going back up. And so it will save the network as it exists right here in that same best file. So every time the testing error goes down, it overwrites that file with the current network. And that's how it saves the best one. If the error doesn't go down during testing, then it doesn't overwrite. And so it's, it keeps that better one in there. So this is something you can keep again in your toolbox of stuff to do. You can grab a better network if you think it might be overtraining. So is that RMS that's showing, is that the lowest one? Like in the left hand corner? Is that oh, the, this here? Is that the lowest or is that the last? And that's the RMS where it tested. So you can see it did the, the last, looks like the last thing it did was testing. Oh, just the last one. So this is the RMS where it was done, not at the lowest one. Okay, let's go back and recreate the network. And which had, uh, you guys have asked questions and I've addressed it somewhat. How many hidden neurons do you really need? That's a big issue. If you put too many in there, it tends to overtrain. You have too many parameters and you need a lot of data to train it. If you don't put enough, you guys found out you don't get good results, right? So where's that sweet spot? Well, people worked on that quite a bit. I need to make sure I can get it tested. Let's recreate our network. Good. Let's change this to block number 200. I'm going to run the save fast. Keep those values the same. But now when we, oh, Lord, sorry, my bad. I need to go back and recreate the network. Because I want to put ton more neurons in the hidden letter. More than 50, which is way more than we need. All right, let's say we don't know that. And now I've got this giant network with a whole bunch of hidden neurons. I'm going to go run, and I'm going to say save best, and then I'm going to click prune. Now, what does prune mean to you, the word? We're not talking about the fruit that nobody likes to eat. You know, if you prune a tree, you cut limbs off, right? So that's what this does, is it prunes neurons that it thinks are not contributing to the output being good. And we have to tell it the maximum number to prune, we're going to do five retries here, just because I played around this, this and it seems to work best. We're going to do 50,000 now, just to do more, to want to train more. I'm going to say it can train up to 20, or it can prune up to 25 neurons. And it's going to base the pruning on RMS error. So it's going to see if a neuron is not changing much with different training pairs coming in, it's going to say, well, it's not really correlated to the input or the output. So I think I got everything set right. Let me check. I'm going to do 6,000 training pairs, 25 max proof, five retries, right? 50 neurons. Training and training and training and testing. Notice that it's got these big X's. Those are neurons that it said, hey, I don't think I need this neuron. So it prunes the net. I tend to not use this a whole lot, but it's a tool that if you feel like you have too many neurons, you can run this and see if it's willing to prune neurons. What I would do here is I'd look at how many neurons it actually kept and then just go back and create a network with that many hidden neurons. 
and go from there. And then you can prune again. Uh, and this might save you a little bit of time and trial and error of trying all of the different possible combinations of hidden neurons, right? So would it even get rid of like whole layers? So if you said like, if you put whatever, 15, 20 in each, in all three hidden layers, would it, if you didn't say you don't right. what, what do we want to do? How many in hidden work are on hidden layer one? That's the nice thing about this software is you can just try it, right? So how many do we want? Somebody pick a number. 50? Sure. Okay. And then how many in the next layer? 20. Okay, do we want to do layer number three? Sure. How many there? 20. 20, all right. Nice thing about software is it's not like a rocket where we launch it and if it's bad, it blows up, right? I guess we could crash the computer if we didn't use Yeah, it's not obvious. Yeah. If we set currently like 70 or something. Yeah, so let's do save best here. We got a ton of numbers, right? Yeah, we got 198 total. So how many say 75 to Sure. Let's see what happens. Yeah, that's not Did I not click the box? Yeah, let's go back. Maybe it didn't. So we got that. Right? Oh wait, now why did it do that? <laughs> like it didn't display the print ones before. Let's try it again here. Yeah, prints checked 75. I don't know why it didn't refresh the display. There we go. Hmm. So I printed a few here and a few here, but it really didn't print any of this in there, did it? But it sure looks like it says, okay, we could pretty much take out this whole hidden layer. Uh, say, yeah. I have a good question this question. What's the difference between the purple box that's big and small and purple box and then the green box that's big? Oh, that's a measure of the, the value that is the output of that neuron at the last training pair that it processed. And I'd have to dig, and I think pink is negative, and, and no, that's not right, because we're using positive values here. I think pink is low and green is big, like pink is closer to zero and green is closer to one. I don't know exactly. I clicked on that neuron to see what's going on with it. Let's see in the output. We have to dig deeper into it to figure that out. But it's trying to show you with the very last training pair that it processed, that's a measure of the activation of those neurons. Good question, though, because yeah, they look different. All right, so that is Save Best, and it's another tool you can use. Um, and I want to call it good for today. We need to go through the, a couple of other definitions and how they use the models because they compare the spreading code to the data model. And they use it two different ways, ways either as a standalone network or what they call one step ahead predictor. I want to make sure we go through that in detail. Before we sign off, any questions about the inverse control? Do you think we're allowed? Any issues with that yet? We haven't looked at it yet. It's still down the road there. Okay. We'll see you next Monday. Good luck, you guys, that are participating in the Rocky. We're all doing that. Good as we're on the team, all together. Different teams. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.